Hey there, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Eric and I'm a final year PhD student in mathematics at the University of Oxford. In this video, we'll tell the story behind Albert Einstein Nobel Prize. A story rooted in politics, scientific skepticism and a good pinch of provincialism. A story about why Einstein received a Nobel Prize one year later than he was supposed to and why the bad faith of an ophthalmologist took out the most famous discovery the theory of relativity from the motivation for his prize. Our story begins in 1901, when Alfred Nobel bestowed upon the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences the honour to choose the winners of what would become the most prestigious prize in many fields. Today, the prize has become an international affair and is awarded with the help of a global network of scientists. But in the early years, the selection process relied solely on the judgment and expertise of the members of the Academy. This meant that candidates and discoveries contributing to established and well-understood scientific fields were much more likely to pull forward during the vote, while innovative discoveries in new and unexplored areas were most likely to be left behind. In addition, the rules set for the Nobel Prize in Physics required the achievement to be tested by time. This, in practice, means that the Academy would wait for conclusive experimental proof to a discovery before assigning the prize, potentially to save the embarrassment of awarding the most important prize to something that ultimately turns out to be false. Both these policies put Einstein's discovery of the theory of relativity to a disadvantage, both as a groundbreaking new theory that completely changed our understanding of the universe and one that didn't receive any empirical proof until several years after it was introduced. The stance and the rules of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences is one piece of the puzzle. The other pieces include the anti-Semitic wave that swept Europe after the First World War, but also Einstein's work and background. He started his academic career in a slightly unconventional way, as a patent officer in the Swiss city of Bern, far from the prestigious physics departments in Germany, which were the true academic power centers of the time. He more than made up for this unconventional start in 1905, which is often referred to as his miraculous year, when in the span of a few months, he published three groundbreaking papers in as many different fields of physics. For the purpose of our story, two of those papers are important. The first one explains the photoelectric effect, the fact that some materials emit electrons when an electromagnetic radiation is shown upon them. The second one introduced the theory of special relativity, the very one that is now inextricably connected with its creator. Soon after this display, Einstein's popularity across the scientific community rose rapidly. He brought in first a teaching position at the local University of Bern, then an associate professorship in Zurich, and finally a chair at the Humboldt University of Berlin, together with the membership of the Prussian Academy of Sciences. Those prestigious positions, the rising fame, and the supporting evidence for his papers that was starting to trickle into the physics journals of the time put him under the radar of the Nobel Committee. While the decisions of the committee are shrouded in secrecy, they are made public after 50 years. So today we know that Einstein had been nominated as early as 1910, and by 1917 he was enjoying modest support and was nominated almost every year. By then, neither the photoelectric effect nor relativity had received definitive experimental proof. Quantum physics, which served as the context for Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect, was the hot topic in the physics community during those years, and was slowly making progress through the concerted efforts of the most brilliant minds of the time. But the community was still split down the middle, with some working to advance the theory, and the rest actively trying to disprove it. It was a controversial topic that didn't lend itself to be the unifying herald of the whole community. This was a problem for the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, which preferred to reward a more established and conclusive result. Relativity had even more problems. Though mathematically sound and enjoying increasing popularity, it lacked 
any kind of experimental validation for more than a decade. The first experiment, conducted by a 1919 British expedition, was inconclusive. They tried to verify the theory by measuring the bending of the light rays during a total eclipse. A brilliant idea, but plagued with technical difficulties, which made the experimental errors larger than the effect they wanted to measure, and ultimately they weren't able to provide any clear conclusion. However, the sheer scope of Einstein's resolve, the slow but relentless experimental efforts devoted to proving them, and the public endorsements by notable physicists, was increasingly at odds with those who were still opposing Einstein's nomination in the circles of the Swedish Academy. The road was paved, and it seemed like it was only a matter of time for Einstein to win the most prestigious prize in physics. But there was one final hurdle to overcome. Olvar Gullstrand. Gullstrand was a brilliant scientist, winner of the 1911 Nobel Prize in Medicine, and, most unfortunately for Einstein, tasked with writing the report on relativity that the Nobel Committee would discuss before casting the votes. Two things are most striking in the choice of Gullstrand as the writer for this report on relativity. His background and his character. While his scientific brilliancy was undisputed, his research focused on physiological and geometric optics, something that today we would consider more akin to ophthalmology and not even remotely connected to theoretical physics. To put it bluntly, his experience and understanding of the recent advancements in theoretical physics were limited at best and completely inadequate at worst. His character wasn't much suited either and was at odds with the task of evaluating an innovative and potentially questioning discovery. He was known for refusing to correct his mistaken conclusions about the cellular composition of the retina, and to stubbornly support older, more cumbersome and less efficient methods of mathematical analysis. He is now largely forgotten by history, while Einstein is widely regarded as a timeless genius. However, at the time, he was on the Nobel Committee and Einstein was not. With a damning report on the theory of relativity, he was able to use the Academy's culture to get what he wanted. You see, in the eyes of the Academy, voting for Einstein in direct opposition to Gullstrand report, the recommendation of an insider, a member of the institution, not to mention one of Sweden's most recognized scientists, would have been not only unacceptable, but nothing short of unthinkable. And yet, the external pressure was mounting, with public endorsement for Einstein piling up from professors across Europe, and even rumors sweeping around physics departments about the Academy intentionally and unfairly withholding a scientific prize for political and potentially anti-Semitic reasons. Basically, the scientific community was sending an unspoken ultimatum to the Academy. It had to be Einstein this time. And so, the conservative Nationalist Academy chose not to choose. Paralyzed by indecision, and crushed between the external pressure and its own pride, the Nobel Committee decided it was better not to award the prize than to give it to relativity. And they voted to defer the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics to the following year. It was the last resistance of a dying ideological opposition that would come crumbling down only 12 months later. One year doesn't seem much for a centuries-old conservative institution to completely change their mind. But in 1921, a seemingly unremarkable event turned the tide in favor of Einstein's case. Carl Wilhelm Ossein, a theoretical physicist from Uppsala, got admitted as a member of the Royal Academy of Science. He quickly made his way up the institution and joined the Nobel Committee the year afterwards. He was a supporter of Einstein's work, having already nominated him to the committee the previous years. But from now on, he could do much more than putting a name forward. He would also be able to participate in the discussion and cast a vote. More importantly, however, he knew something that few people knew. He knew the reason behind the debacle of 1921. He knew Gullstrand and regularly corresponded with him, using those letters to support the cause for relativity. He had pointed out Gullstrand's misunderstanding several times, 
but ultimately it was up to Goldstrand to decide what to include in his report, and he chose to ignore most of those comments. This even prompted Ossian to complain about his colleague, although only privately, calling his report a misfortune and considering it the result of the lack of understanding of the theoretical work he was tasked to evaluate. So, being familiar with both the unsurmountable factiousness of the report and the political culture inside the academy, he chose to play his cards strategically. Knowing that relativity was too revolutionary for gaining a large enough support inside the committee, he decided to put forward Einstein's candidacy pointing to a different contribution of his, the photoelectric effect. This choice didn't come without its problems. Quantum theory was only slightly less unpopular with the Academy than relativity. In addition, just two years prior, Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius had written another unflattering report, this time on the photoelectric effect, noting that quantum theory was largely developed by others and that the role of Einstein's paper was fairly marginal to the field. And yet, Ossain had one last ace to play. He linked his candidacy in favour of Einstein to the one in favour of Danish physicist Niels Bohr. He was another rising star of 20th century physics and was well known to the Academy thanks to several Nobel nominations in support of his quantum theory of the atom that were received in previous years. He highlighted the strong connection between Einstein's empirical contribution and Bohr's theoretical results. He exploited the indecision of the previous year and, by combining the two nominations, was able to address the concerns of the Academy against speculative theories. And this was enough to sweeten the pill for quantum theory. It also bypassed the criticism by Arrhenius, as the two works, together, created a complete and compelling model of both theoretical value and experimental validation. As a result, 1922 saw two of the most important physicists of the last century, Einstein and Bohr, win two different Nobel Prizes at the same time. And Einstein finally got his prize, for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect, as the official website states to this day, glaringly avoiding any mention of relativity altogether. And in the end, why not? It's a celebration of a less known achievement yet equally groundbreaking as its most famous Skousen. And it also serves as a reminder that, despite physics being about verifiable results and universal truth, the people that makes it possible are still people. And where there are people, there's politics. If you've liked this video and would like to stay up to date with other videos like this as they come out, please consider subscribing to the channel for more videos coming out twice a week on Wednesdays and Sundays. Until next Sunday, goodbye!